we're going to read Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 10, and, and we're not going to get through the whole thing. I thought I'd get through three-fourths of it to the first service. I got through one-third, and I was like, well, let's just see. But it's, a, it's an incredible passage. Look what he says. Open your Bibles. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through the faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Father, I thank you that you've preserved your word for us. I'm so grateful to you that it's always relevant. Thousands of years after Paul wrote this, it's still relevant. We're still struggling with the same things. And I pray that your spirit would just move upon us in a powerful way. Lord, our hearts, we've gathered here because we hunger for transformation. And I pray that you would take us on this journey to know intimacy with you. Lord, would you shine into our hearts, give us revelation to see what it is that we're looking for, for merit, for gain, so that we can count it but loss. Lord, work in us now in the next 20, 30 minutes. Would you minister in a powerful way through us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. But whatever gain I had... I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Now, when you think about it, the world and certainly all religion is all about the gains. And it's kind of how where we live our lives. Uh, you look back in the previous verses, and I knew I wouldn't have time for that, so I left them out, but you can go back and study this. Paul lays out, well, all of his gains. He was a Jew, and he was a tribe of Benjamin, and, and he lists out all of the gains. And I thought about that. Isn't it a good thing that we've gotten all past that? But we really haven't, have we? No, I mean, we do it, right? It, we, we have uh, all these things that we try to attribute to our gains. So uh, if we're Baptists, we say, well, that, that's, I'm in the gain column. And what kind of Baptists are we? And what affiliation are we? Or we're Pentecostal, and we put that as a gain. Or we're Methodists, and we put, put that to our gain. Or we're, we're uh, Wiscopalians. <laughs> I was talking about the first service. I, my, my, my children, we first came to Bernie. You know, we, we were a little shelter shock. My, my children were at a place that served cocktails. And um, I didn't say I was. I was saying my children. I'm not responsible for everything my children. They said, Dad, you'll never, for, you'll never believe it. We met a Wiscopalian. <laughs> of course, you know, um, I'm like, a Wiscopalian? They go, yeah. You know, they, they were, were in Bernie, and they were having a drink. And uh, the guy said, well, what are you doing in Bernie? He goes, oh, my dad's uh, going to be teaching at Faith Bible Church. He goes, oh, I'm a Wiscopalian. And uh, my daughter loved it because she had never heard of it. She's probably converted, I'm sure. But, <laughs> uh, you know, he was making a joke. You know, he's a, an Episcopalian who drinks whiskey, I guess. But, you know, uh, what do we do? We say, I'm this. And why do we say, why do we find identity in denomination? Because we're looking for a gain. We're really no different than the Jews were, were we? We're, we're looking to attribute gains. We, we look to our titles and we say, this is my gain. We look to our possessions, what kind of car we drive, what kind of house we live in, what kind of possessions we have, what kind of title we have, what kind of reputation. We have. We're all her searching to gain and we want to add to our gain column. In Paul's Jewish heritage, righteousness and uh, identity and value came from your associations. And in his case, his, his faithfulness to Phariseeism. But I was thinking about, we do the same thing. We're, we look for value in worth. We look for identity in what we do and what we possess. And we have kind of a column. Have you ever tried to make decisions like that? 
I don't remember where I got it, but there was a good Christian emphasis where, where you want to know the will of God, you just write in one column the positives and in the other column the negatives, right? And at the, you determine the will of God by the column that had the most positives and the least amount of negatives. And I thought, you know, most of us just kind of live there, positives and negatives, gains and losses, and in our mind, we have this idea that, that we, we're, we're coming to God with all of these gains. And these gains are what give us approval. These gains are what give us merit. These gains are what gives us identity. And he said, listen, you're missing out. You're missing out on what the gospel is really about because it's all about the gain. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ." You see, the reality is long as we're looking to add those check marks on the positive side, the gain side, the way that we, we're looking for righteousness apart from him. And Paul said that he had to come to the place where he counted. Uh, it, it's, it's like a banking term to reckon. He, he said, I had to come to the place where I was willing to reckon all of these positives, all these things that, that we consider to make myself valuable uh, and pleasing to God. He said, I had to count all of this as loss for the sake of Christ. Most of us spend our entire lives trying to gain the pleasure of God. Right? And, and I'm not talking about unbelievers because I don't think most unbelievers are really even worried about it, are they? But you and I, I spent most of my Christian life, most of my ministry striving to get to the place where I felt like God could smile at me, where I had done enough where God could be pleased. And what Paul is saying, listen, you have to get to the place. I mean, you go to the jungle and you start churches and you evangelize people who have never heard the gospel and you baptize people and you think when, when it, it was never enough. I remember in one whole region, there was village after village that, that Vanessa and I and the kids and our cohorts, we would go and we had, I got to the place where we had handed out so many tracts over so many people wouldn't even take them. They go, oh, I've already read that. And yet it was never enough. And I thought, man, if God could just, if I could just do enough, then God would be happy. And then it struck me. God doesn't love me for what I can do for him. God loves me for who I am. I, I remember the beauty of parenthood, right? Before you have teenagers. I remember Vanessa and I, well, I, I had really very little to do with it. I mean, I made a contribution, but I didn't do much with the birth of this child. We call our oldest son, Ryan. And I just was blown away by this whole thing. And I would remember, I would take him and I would lay his body. You know, when, remember when they were so little? And I would lay his body. I'd put his head in my hand and lay his body right on my arm and his feet would kind of dangle there and I could coo at him. I could talk, you know, that gibberish that we talk to kids with it. Daddy loves you. And then you wonder why it takes two years for them to speak. <laughs> Am I right? Like if we just spoke regular English to them, they'd be speaking in six months, right? They'd be like, oh, that's fine. But it's getting rid of all that. What does that mean? You know, and you take them and, and you know in your own way you had these experiences that this is yours. And you love them for what reason? They're yours and no other reason. And what in the world can they do for you? Nothing. In fact, worse than do nothing for you, what do they do to you? Right? You know, you're loving on them and just 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 pouring out all that you are to them and then they're absorbing and they go. <laughs> and this odor <laughs> and this <laughs> comes out of them. And what do you do? I mean, you're a reasonable person. Where's your mother? <laughs> Is this the way you're going to respond to my love? You say, like, no way. Now, you might have given them back to the mom to get cleaned up, 
right? Because most of us men were not built for that. I mean, I used to watch Ryan because I was a, it was before I was working in business and I, I, I was working a shift and I would work uh, in the evening and Vanessa worked in the day and I'd take care of him and he, you know, he had one of those complete disasters where it's coming up out of his mouth. I, I got in big trouble because I stuck him in the shower <laughs> and hosed him off, you know? And she thought that was inappropriate, but all I was trying to do was get him clean, <laughs> you know? So I'm not saying I might have handled it exactly the right way, but the, the whole point of the, the, what I'm trying to get along is what did I do as a parent? I mean, even as an incompetent man, what did I do? It worked. It worked. I mean, it was bad. I cleaned him up so that I could do what? Express love to him. Do you see what I'm trying to get you to realize? He, he, he says, listen, he says, you have, to, you have to come to the place where you realize that you have the pleasure of God now. Why? Because you are his. And in our minds, we, we, we grow up and we think, yeah, but I've got to grow up and now I've got to make a contribution. And when I make enough of a contribution, when I give enough and when I serve enough and when I do enough, then he'll smile at me. But I, I hope you'll realize that he has you in his hands. And there's freedom of coming to the place where you see yourselves as the beloved of God. We were talking in Sunday school in Ray's class and we're talking about the, the passage in John. And it's over and over again. John says, I am the one whom Jesus loved. And it struck me in the Sunday school class was, oh, if I could just come to live there. What would happen if we didn't define ourselves by what we do? We, right, because we, we have these we have business cards, and we, our business cards define us by what we do: real estate, or or uh, uh, truck driver, or businessman, or doctor, or accountant, or veterinarian, or whatever we do. And we take so much because we we're still trying to get value and worth from the very things we 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 have we have all of these things in our what list on our positive side, on our merit side. But what would it, where would we live? How free would we be if we could come to the place where we lived and we counted all those things but loss? And the only thing that mattered is I am him whom Jesus loved. I know in my own kind of driven personality that I have this temptation to think that God will be more pleased with the more I do. But I thought, how liberating would it be if I could come to the place where I lived and settle in my identity, my worth, my value? Who am I? I am him whom Jesus loved. I think it was Brennan Manning, but I'm not sure. I didn't think about this till Sunday school. But I think in one of his books, he had this quote. He was talking about John putting his head up against the breast of Jesus. And he heard the heartbeat of God, and his heart was beating love for him. You see, when we get to the place where we realize God's heart beats love for me, when I get to the place where I am him whom Jesus loves, then I am willing to count as loss all of the things that I was looking at for gain. Paul was striving for righteousness apart from Jesus Christ, and it came from being a Jew, and it came from being a tribe, and it came from being a strict uh, Pharisee. And he said, listen, I count all things lost for the sake of Christ. Because the reality is, as long as we're going down our checklist, our positives, our merit side, we don't experience Christ because it's about us. And Paul's saying, listen, it's really not about us. It's not about what we have to do. We come to Jesus empty-handed. Or we don't really come to him, do we? I meet people sometimes, and over the years of evangelizing, I, I've always enjoyed it. You know, you come to someone and you'll say, what, however you say, do you know for sure that when you die, you're going to go to heaven? And, and I love it because one of the most frequent responses is, oh, yeah. I'm pretty good. Why do we answer like that? Because we have a list. We have gains. You know, and the beauty of it is if you compare yourself to someone else, you can always find someone to have a gain on. Don't we do it? 
We find someone kind of mentally, we may not point them out or talk to them about it, but we, we find these people that we can compare ourselves so that we can come out and look be well on the gain side. And sometimes we do it by the things we do and sometimes we, we put the gain list by the things that we don't do. And he's saying, listen, he's saying, when we try to establish righteousness through what we do, through our list of the game, we can always be in judgment, always be criticizing, always evaluating what other people do or don't do. And we miss out on who? On Christ. We miss out on experience what it is just to be loved, the one whom Jesus loves. The world system permeates the church. This religion where it's all about gains. And Paul says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. I know probably for some of you kind of gets frustrating because I say it so often, but I think it's so important. It's Jesus plus nothing. And religion is Jesus plus me. And sometimes it's me plus Jesus which I think is probably worse, right? We get this idea, me and I just need a little help and I just need Jesus. And you're Jesus and he needs a little help and it's me. And what is he saying? He's saying, listen, it's Jesus in the beginning and it's Jesus in the middle. And at the end of it all, at the end of life, at the end of the journey, what is it really all about? Is it gonna be me and all of the things I have on my gain list? Or is it gonna be Jesus? For the sake of Christ. What amazing thing he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. He's out there killing Christians in pursuit of it because he has all of these gains. He was zealous for what he thought was God. Can't religious people be zealous for all the wrong reasons? And isn't it almost always about their gains? They'll they'll come and they'll criticize and they'll say, well, you know, uh, so and so. Sometimes it's the pastor. Oh, well, if Pastor Tim would just do this, and if he just knew this, and, and uh, you know why? They're comparing their gains to why? Because when you have a list of gains, you think you're better than someone else based on what you do or don't do. Well, what kind of bondage is that? It's horrible bondage, right? He says, listen, what we need to do is come to the place where we count it all lost where we count it all lost because until we count it all lost, we're never going to enter into a relationship of intimacy with the person of Christ because it's about us. And it really is, friends, about Jesus plus nothing and that equals everything. And as soon as you enter into the equation of the doing and the gains, you miss out on the experience of Christ. When he, Paul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was proud, he was full of self-righteousness. And at that moment, he met Christ, he came to the end of his own resources, and he realized all that I thought was gain is now loss. He says, indeed, I count everything as loss. Look at this, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Think about it. I was reading my notes again this morning and I, I saw the surpassing worth. I underlined it again. Just like the Spirit of God leaped in my heart, the surpassing worth. Think about the way the enemy tries to deceive us to think that worth, value, the things that are important are somehow outside of Jesus Christ. Until you see Christ as the surpassing worth, you're never going to count those other things but loss. He says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of Christ Jesus, my Lord. If any of us are going to enter into Christ, we have to first come to the place where we're willing to lose our own righteousness. We'll never cherish Christ while holding on to our own righteousness. We think we need to bring something to Christ, but really it is. We come to him empty-handed, and really we stay empty-handed. Whenever it comes back to us, it's always going to rob us of the experience of intimacy of him where we sur- the surpassing worth of knowing. The surpassing worth of knowing him. There's something that surpasses all our goodness. 
And that's to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ our Lord. Somehow John the Apostle and Paul the Apostle came to the place where they were at, had exhausted all of their self-righteousness, exhausted all of their self-sufficiency, had came to the place where they said, you know what? I am whom Jesus loves. I'm the one that Jesus loves. And all of a sudden they're liberated from doing. It doesn't mean they don't do anything. Does it? Well, look at what Paul did. But it was no longer the doing in order to be on the gain side. He's still going to do much through us, maybe even more through us, but it will be an effortless doing in the sense that it's him doing it through us. Now we're simply the vessel. We're not striving to achieve, to come to the place we're accepted. We live from the place of our acceptance. We live knowing that the only thing that matters is not how many people I win to Christ, how many people I baptize, how many churches I serve, or how big the church grows, or what accomplish, or all of the things we look to kind of measure success. And we say, listen, just to know him. And this is to know him, not with the intellect, but to know him experientially. It refers all in the Greek to all this intimacy. In the scripture, when he talks to this word, no, it was often used to refer to sexual relationship. When there was an intimacy in a marriage relationship, he knew her. He was talking about the same word, this gnosko. And he's saying, man, there's something that surpasses all else. There's something that surpasses all of my achievements. There's something that surpasses all of my possessions. There's something that surpasses my bank account and the car I drive. There's something that surpasses all that life tries to defraud to, to me of. It's to know him, Christ Jesus, my Lord. But there's a point here, and he says, you have to count. And it was interesting to me when I looked at this, count is in the present tense. He didn't count at one time when he got born again. He counted it daily. There's a point because there is this temptation to go back, think, oh, uh, I'm in and now I got to do to stay in. And doesn't religion even use that kind of manipulation to kind of keep people under control? <laughs> That's exactly what it's all about. How many control freaks in this room? How many liars? <laughs> uh, right when I said, uh, 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 how many control freaks in this room? And a few honest people raised their hand. A few spouses were going. <laughs> we're all kind of control freaks, aren't we? In one way, we have different ways of trying to control, but we're all trying to control, right? Because we think it's still all about us. He says, Christ Jesus, my Lord. Gosh, I wish I had more time to, to go into this. Why does he say, my Lord? Because he's saying, the one who reigns over me. Listen, you will never allow him experientially to be the Lord of your life as long as you're counting your gains. Because if it's about gains and losses, you have to be in control. Something came to me in the first service was, man, I don't think of myself as a super control freak, but listen, if you hurt me, I have all these defense mechanisms. What is that? Control. Have you ever been wounded and tried to protect yourself? Nobody's shaking their head. They're all like, no, I've never been wounded. I, I live in the Garden of Eden. Where do you live? <laughs> right? Has anybody in here been hurt and wounded? Yes, I breathe. I have a heart. I've been wounded. I've been hurt. Why? And what's your temptation? Control. And we try to protect ourselves from being what? Hurt again. And so what is he saying? He's saying, listen... Paul had this way where he realized it was all about, he was willing to count this whole list of gains. He was willing to count this whole list of gains loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, his Lord. He came to the place where he was willing to see that Christ Jesus is the one who reigned and Christ Jesus didn't need his help. Oh, that's a shock. Right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Someone said hallelujah, but most of us are going like, you mean none of my help? I mean, he needs certainly my counsel and advice, right? 
No. Right? We'll never come to the place where we see the surpassing worth of knowing Christ until we first come to consider all our merits, all our self-generated righteousness as laws. Paul says, then you can be my Lord. What are you counting as gain? You know, is it denominationalism? Uh, Certain theologies? Associations? Um, things that you do, things that you don't do, possessions that you have, titles that you have. I mean, think about how the world kind of traps us. And we start to try and get this whole list of gains so we can feel good about us. And Jesus says there's something liberating about counting that whole list and wiping it clean, counting all of these things as lost. Because on this list, I'm the source. What I know, what I believe, what I do, what I don't do. You know what I'm saying? And we do it all, don't we? And we all have a temptation. Because some of you are like, oh, that, that really applies to Don. I can see that. <laughs> Poor Don. No. Who does it apply to? Me. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Now, I don't think Paul was really talking about salvation here. I think he was talking about the experience as Christ as life. For his sake, I had suffered the loss of all things. What happened to Paul? Do you think what happened? Think of all the associations. I mean, he was out there killing Christians. He must have had some cheerleaders. Right? Somebody was funding this crusade, this pursuit. He wasn't traveling on his own dime. There were people who were supporting him, encouraging him, cheering him on. I mean, you think about, I'm the youngest uh, member of the Sanhedrin. I'm, the, I'm this. I'm, got, I'm the one that, they, that was in authority when, when Stephen was killed. Think of all the things in his Judaism, in his self-righteousness that he counted as gain. And then he encounters Jesus Christ and he says, ooh, a whole new perspective. And he lost all of those relationships. He lost all of the friends that he had. The very people that were his friends and cheerleaders became his enemies seeking to destroy him. And he suffered the loss of all things, and then he counted them as rubbish. This is probably as far as I could go this morning. But I want to lead you to this place. What is it that you've got in your gain column? And don't like sit there and look at me like, well, I'm like so past this, Pastor. You got something that you think makes you better than someone else. And maybe not one thing, maybe a whole list of things. And what I want to invite you to say is, will you let the Holy Spirit of God right now show you what you've got in your gain column? And would you count it loss? You have to do the counting. You have to do, this could be translated reckoning. You reconcile your bank account, don't you? That's not encouraging. (laughs) My wife's back there going, what's a bank account? (laughs) That's something you have to worry about. (laughs) Um, No, we got to reconcile that baby so we know what we got, right? We do the reckoning. Will you reckon it? It's not for me to tell you what you have in your gain column. But you got stuff in your gain column. And all the things that we have in our gain column become a hindrance or a barrier to our experiencing intimacy with Jesus Christ. It could be religious things that you do because you think it's going to make him happier with you. He's saying, will you count them rubbish in order that I may gain Christ? I know that I am on a constant pursuit 
to count those things lost, that I might greater and increasingly experience intimacy with Christ. Sometimes I got to count education as a loss. Sometimes I got to count religious activity as a loss. Because in my personality, man, I just have this tendency to think the more I do, the more pleased God will be. And as long as Tim Ekno lives thinking the more he does, the more pleased God will be, what will he always do? Do more. And while I'm doing more, can I lay my head on the breast of Jesus? Someone said in Sunday school, I thought it was just, you know, perfect, was Mary lived there. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus because she counted him to be surpassingly worth anything she could do. It was just sitting there. But you got to beware of the Marthas in your life. Because Marthas are always going to be there saying, hey, there's dishes to be done. And sometimes we're the Marthas, right? He's saying, will you count this but loss to gain Christ? To experience him in deeper intimacy? Father, I just trust this is what you had to say to your sheep, and I know that you love them. And while their heads are bowed and their eyes are closed, would you help them to see their themselves in your outstretched arm. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want you to just, just let me walk you through it, okay? There you are. Do you see his hand stretched out? And Abba's hand is opened up. And there you are, your head lying in the palm of Jesus. Your body is stretched out on his arm. And he's cooing at you. He's cooing at you. Now, no doubt, even now, you're thinking about how you've messed this thing up. But what does he do? He's in a perpetual state of cleansing you. We don't have time to go there. I, I, the scripture backs it up that you're constantly being cleansed. You want to focus on the dirty diaper, and he wants to focus on the cooing. Now you see yourself there, and your body's stretched out over his, and he's cleansed you yet again. Will you say with me? Will you confess with me? I am him whom Jesus loves. Now to get there, you got to count all those gains but loss. All the things that you were looking to to establish worth and value and identity come from what you do. Or don't do. But you're the child. You have nothing to offer. Maybe all we'll do is mess it up. But there he is. We've all messed up. We've all made a huge stink. But Jesus came to cleanse us. And so, Lord, we just make a choice of our will right now to count all the things that we had as gain as loss, to gain you, to ever increase in experiencing you with intimacy. And when, Lord, I fall back, adding to my gain column, Remind us to count it all loss. Jesus, work in us. 
move us in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen.